Good morning, Grizzlies. So yesterday, Annie and Teresa and Moose finally get to the Esther P. Marinoff where they meet um, what appears to be Sadie, who is um, Natalie's sort of teacher. And Moose kind of feels like she's being rather rough about things, but she's trying to get Sadie to, or trying to get, Sadie's trying to get Natalie to really be able to speak for herself. So here we go. Chapter 15. May Capone is a looker. Same day, Sunday, August 18th, 1935. We're almost to the field where Scout plays. Actually, we're almost to the field where Scout doesn't play. My plan is to see that Scout isn't there, get some roses, and somehow manage to convince Teresa to give them to May without Annie knowing. I try to focus on this and not on Natalie, but Nat's words have crawled inside my head. Moose. I missed Moose. What was so disturbing about seeing her today was I suddenly realized how hard she was trying. I thought she didn't try, but it's much more upsetting to realize she actually does try. She tries very hard for what seems like such a small result. I forced myself to stop thinking about this. Right now, I've got to figure out how to keep Al Capone from hunting me down. I can't allow myself to think about anything else. I'm just turning my plan around in my head when two girls in white gloves and hats start waving wildly to Annie. Dolores! Peggy! Annie hurries to catch up with them. The girls' heads cluster together like three birds with one cracker. They peek up at me and duck down again for more whispering. Is it? Is it him? I hear one ask. Annie blushes all the way down to the roots of her yellow moon-colored hair. I look around to see who they're talking about. Teresa skips over to the girls to find out what's going on. Annie's still pink face appears. Moose, these are my friends, Dolores, she points to the one with buck teeth, and Peggy, she nods to the short girl. I raise my hand in a wooden wave and drop it again. Dolores and Peggy smile at Annie like they're all in on a secret. We better get going, I tell Annie. Have fun, Annie, Peggy giggles. Yeah, Annie, Dolores, the one with the buck teeth, chimes in. Now, wouldn't it be nice if Annie decided to go off with them? I can't imagine how I'll get Teresa to help me with Annie around. No such luck. Annie stays. How am I going to do this? I could leave the roses for May in the visitor section of the boat, but with May Capone on board, won't there be extra officers on the cokes? There always are on visitor's day, and I'll bet there will be twice as many when the visitor is Scarface's wife. Trixel will be there for certain. He'd never miss this. I can just imagine what would happen if he found the roses. Teresa skips ahead. I walk with Annie. Where do you guys play exactly? Annie asks, looking down the long expanse of grass at the marina green. On a back street a few minutes from here, I tell her. You know, Moose, I've been thinking. Are you sure Al Capone got her in that school? It doesn't look like a gangland operation to me, Annie says. Which would look how? I ask, stepping off the curb to avoid the man selling apples. This is what men do when they can't get work. If I get caught, will this happen to my father? More silk and whiskey. Glamorous stuff. You know, no way Capone had anything to do with that place. Maybe not. I don't know if I like the place anyway. I don't like it when they put words in her mouth, I confess. You just didn't like what Natalie had to say. The place is good for her, Moose. Trust me, Annie says. Trust her. Right. Everybody thinks they know what's best for Natalie. Religion, leafy green vegetables, stricter discipline, ice compresses, voodoo. I've heard it all. But wait a minute. If Annie thinks the Esther P. Marinoff school is the right place for Natalie, maybe she'll have changed her mind about telling. So you don't want to wreck it for Natalie, my voice squeaks hopefully. It was a mistake is all. That's what I think, Annie declares. I heard my dad talking to my Uncle Tony when we drove down to San Mateo yesterday. I was in the rumble seat. They thought I was asleep. My dad said he played chess with Buddy Boy when Buddy was in the hospital. Buddy's a great chess player and so is my dad. Guards aren't supposed to play chess with inmates. That I know for sure. They had to be quiet, so they passed notes to let each other know stuff. Done. Your turn. Doesn't that sound like the kind of notes you pass in a game? They must have gotten in your laundry by mistake. Maybe, I reply, scratching a hive on my elbow. I would have totally believed it was possible if I hadn't received the note about May and the roses. There's no way that was about a chess game. But I'm not about to tell Annie this. Who won? I ask. Buddy. Annie's eyes are hopeful. 
I think it was all an accident, she confides. I look up from where I've been clawing my elbow. So you'll play baseball with me on Alcatraz. Annie squints at me. You haven't gotten any other notes, have you? I can't lie about this. Not to Annie. I look down the quiet back street. A ragman calls in the distance. A milkman play, knocks on a door. A cluster of girls plays jacks in the street. This is where we play, I announce. Here? Annie is incredulous. I told you he wouldn't be here today. I say, hoping Annie won't notice I didn't answer her question about the notes. Teresa bounces back to us. If he's not here, we should go find him. Can we, Moose? Can we? There's no time, I tell Teresa. I gotta get back. I promised my mom and I have to buy flowers. Teresa mouth, Teresa's mouth pulls to one side. But we would have had time to play, though. That would have taken time, she reasons. Yeah, but Scout lives pretty far from here. We don't have time to go get him and then play. I'm pleased with how this comes out. It sounds like I know what I'm talking about. You're going to buy flowers for Piper? Annie asks. I'd planned to say my mom, but suddenly Piper sounds like a better idea. Mostly because I have never in my life bought my mom flowers. Not that I'd buy them for Piper, but it does seem more likely. This lying business is a lot more complicated than it looks. Yeah, I say. Ooh, Teresa's eyes seek Annie's. It's a good idea, Annie tells me. She's mad at you, you know. Tell me about it, I say. Don't worry, she's mad at the world right now. My mom says it's because she's been the apple of her dad's eye, and now all he ever talks about is how much he wants a son. Piper won't do well as second fiddle. The corners of Annie's mouth sneak up a little. So where are we going to get the flowers? Teresa wants to know. Let's walk down Union, probably a flower stand there. We walk about six blocks and don't find anything. So Annie goes into a butcher shop and asks. The butcher directs us to a small stand, no bigger than an outhouse. They have roses, red, yellow, and pink. My gut pinches when I see how expensive they are. How can something you can just pick cost so much? I don't have enough for a dozen, but I can buy a half a dozen. Will that be enough? What color? Annie asks. Yellow, I tell the man behind the counter. I'd go with red. Yellow is friendship. Red is, you know. Annie moves her almost white eyebrows up and down. That's why I want yellow, I insist. Carefully, I take my bat, ball, and glove out of the bag and set the yellow roses inside. I don't want Darby Trixel or any of the other officers to see I'm carrying them. I wonder if Annie will comment about this, but she doesn't say a word. The closer we get to the water, the worse my hives itch. This, then this Annie notices. What are you scratching so much for? You allergic to flowers? Hey, look, Teresa points to the dock at Fort Mason where we catch the boat to Alcatraz. Maybe 50 or 100 people are milling around like ants in a sugar bowl. A man standing on a barrel waves his arms and calls out, May Capone, the wife of public enemy number one. She's right here, folks. Don't miss this. Gonna visit her hubby on the rock. She's quite the beauty, too. Come on, folks. May Capone, right here. Teresa grabs my arm. Did you hear that? May Capone? Come on. But I'm not thinking about May. I'm thinking about Al. The man is stark raving mad. How am I supposed to give his wife flowers with all these people around? The place is swarming with reporters. They probably snap my picture as I give them to her. Then I'll be in the morning papers. That's just what I need. The warden would fire my father in a heartbeat. I can't get Teresa to hand May the roses either. If her picture gets in the paper, she'll get in trouble, same as I would. Didn't Scarface know May would be mobbed like this? A reporter in a gray suit leans toward us. He hands out business cards like he's dealing from a deck. You kids live on Alcatraz? What's the word on Capone? We heard he's got his own furniture up there. Oriental rugs and the whole nine yards. Capone gonna bust right out of there. You heard it from me, the man on the barrel shouts. A man with a puffy nose waves his big hand in my face. You live on the rock? He shoves a slip of paper at me as a guy stinking of cigarettes hurries past. A hot tip's worth cash money to me. A guy with hairy wrists folds my hand around his card. We can't, sir. The warden won't let us talk to reporters, Annie tells him as the crowd presses in. She's coming, Teresa shouts. My pulse is growing louder like my own heart is getting closer to me. A man scrambles over the back of another. A large woman picks a reporter up and moves him out of her way. A guy with a hat two sizes too small is shooting photos in a mad rush. Another man in a dark suit elbows in front of me. This is crazy. Let's get on the boat. Annie pulls Teresa and me past the buck sergeant who checks us off on his clipboard. We scoot up the ramp and out of the fray. 
Back onto the boat, settling against the railing, we see the tops of everyone's heads as they rush make a pone. May hides behind her mink wrap and her leather gloves cover what little of her face isn't buried in mink. A hat with a brown veil sits smartly on her short platinum blonde movie star hair. I can't hardly see her, but one thing is clear. May Capone is a looker. She's making her way up the gangplank, but it's slow going. How's he doing? His life in danger? What can you tell us, Mrs. Capone? And then from the back of the crowd, Warden Williams appears, flanked by three Angel Island Army officers. Oh, great. This is just what I need. The warden. Gentlemen, gentlemen, give the lady some room, please. The warden's booming voice barks. The people nearest the warden sense the power shift and they take a reluctant step back. What am I supposed to do now? Give May roses in front of the warden? It kind of explains why Piper isn't here, though. She must have known he'd be on the boat. They like the big guy in Alcatraz? They treating him right? One man in the back keeps at it. Another officer positions his barrel chest between May and the reporters. A skeleton-thin man throws a fistful of cards her way. Boyd's the name at the examiner. I'll make it worth your while. But the warden is on him now. He picks up the cards and hands them back. These won't be necessary, Mr. Floyd, he says. The warden and the officers have the crowd in hand now. A path clears for May Capone and she heads up the gangplank straight for us. Her cheeks are flushed. Her lips are like bright boysenberries. Her perfume smells of lilacs and talcum powder mixed with the dead fish at the dock. She's so close I could reach out and touch her soft brown leather glove. I glance down at the warden still on the dock. His back is to us as he confers with one of the Angel Island officers. May's mink brushes past my arm. Excuse me, May says. My mouth drops open. All I can think about is giving her the roses, but I can't do that here. Not with the warden right there. What am I, nuts? Teresa jabs her elbow in my side. Me. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Capone? I stutter. And then suddenly it occurs to me. If I give roses to every woman on the boat, I won't get in trouble. I grab a rose and hand it to May as she sweeps past. Here and here. I give another to Annie and one Teresa. May smiles at me, a beautiful smile. Why, thank you. Moose, isn't it? She says, and then she's gone. Yellow rose in hand, flanked by officers in Darby Trixel. Teresa's eyes are big as bunt cakes. Why'd you do that? She asks. But I ignore Teresa as I hurry over to Doc Ollie's sister, who looks exactly like him. She even wears the high-heeled equivalent of his sturdy shoes. I give her a rose and one to Mrs. Cacconi and one to Beatrixel. Why, Moose? Beatrixel's face glows all the way down to the mouse-brown roots of her newly blonde hair. Isn't that the sweetest thing? What a nice young man you are. Darby! Oh, Darby! Bee waves her husband down. See what that nice Flanagan boy gave me? She jiggles the rose in his face. Darby sucks on his bottom lip. A rose. Long stem, too, B tells Darby. You know my birthday is coming up. Yes, honey bunch. Trixel glares at me. I know. They couldn't be that expensive if a 12-year-old boy got one, B tells him as the warden appears, walking across the deck in his deliberate manner, the boat gently swaying. He surveys the scene. Where did the roses come from? The warden asks Trixel. Trixel wags his head in my direction. Flanagan boy, sir. The warden looks at me so hard it feels like he can see through my skull. What's this business about, Matthew? He asks, using my real name, which always means trouble. My knees are quaking under me. Nothing, sir, I tell him, trying to force my voice through my tight throat. Nothing, is it? The warden raises his eyebrows. Quite the ladies' man, aren't you? No, sir, I mutter. That's not what my piper says. I have my eye on you, Flanagan. The warden shakes his head. Got my fingers crossed. The next one is a boy, so I won't have to worry about the likes of Moose Flanagan, he tells Trixel. Ain't nothing like a boy, sir, Trixel agrees. Me and the missus got our hopes on one, too. For 20 years, been hangering for a son. The warden smiles, his chest full, his blue eyes bright with possibility. Then he seems to realize I am still here. Go on, get out of here, Mr. Flanagan, the warden tells me, and I begin to walk away, but then I hear Trixel. It ain't Moose I worry about. It's his sister. She's not even on the island now, right? The warden asks. Yeah, but she's coming back. Ain't that right, Moose? Trixel raises his voice so I can hear. He knows I'm listening to this. I turn around. Yes, sir, but we keep a close eye on her. She's never been in any trouble, sir. I tell him. Trixel snorts. She's a loose cannon. It's a crying shame, it is. 
Let normal kids mix it up with buggy ones, Darby tells the warden. Don't know what some people is thinking. Natalie's not buggy. She just thinks a different way. The words shoot out of me before I can stop them. I know my dad would not like me talking to the warden and Trixel like this. Is that so? Trixel asks. Yes, sir. I nod to the warden. It is. When I get back to Annie and Teresa, they're staring at me, their eyes squinting, their mouths half open. They have clearly been discussing me in my absence. We can't take these, Annie says, the wind whipping her hair, the rose held tightly against her chest. They're for Piper, Teresa scolds, leaning close so I can hear her over the wind and the rumbling motor. Of course you can. I always meant to give them to you. I just wanted to surprise you, I tell them. Surprise us? Annie cocks her head. Teresa squints at me. She clearly doesn't believe this. No, really, I say, steadying myself on the boat railing. Annie looks at the rose, holds it delicately with her hand. A smile forms on her big square lips as she smells it. Are you sure? She asks without looking at me. Sure, I'm sure, I say. But what about Piper? Teresa insists. I don't want to give Piper flowers. Annie watches me from behind the rose. That's not what you said, she says. Like I said, I wanted to surprise you. Annie's pale cheeks are flushed. She lets her finger bump on the smooth part of the stem. She holds it safe from the wind. But Moose, Teresa jabs her elbow in my side. May said your name. She couldn't have, I tell them. She did though, I heard it with my own ears. Teresa touches one of her ears as if to prove her point. I don't know, Teresa. I murmur with one eye on Annie. I can't tell if Annie's listening or not. You don't know? Teresa's eyes are white all around. I have to put it in my book, Moose. This is a very strange occurrence, she informs me. I wish she wouldn't, but then most of what she writes is made up anyway. No one will think it's actually true. In the visitor's section, I see May Capone holding her yellow rose across her lap. Doc Ollie's old sister with her practical shoes has placed the rose behind her ear like she's become a flamenco dancer. And there's B. Trixel talking to Mrs. Cacconi, holding the rose as if it is made of glass. It's amazing the power of a few stupid flowers. Simply amazing.